The interview is being conducted for the Veterans History Project for the Library of Congress. The veteran's name is Richard Maddox. He was born on November 3, 1930, and served in the Army during the Korean War. He achieved the rank of First Lieutenant. We are recording this on April 26, 2013. I'm Heidi Gerstmeyer, and I'm conducting the interview. No relation. So do you mind telling us where you grew up? Uh, I was born and read in Columbia and came to Clemson di uh, directly from Columbia. Um, and where did you go after Clemson? I'm sorry? Where did you go after Clemson? Um, two months after I graduated, I was in the Army. <laughs> I was at Fort Benning for about three and a half months or so. And then uh, I went from there to Japan. They had some leave time in between and so on, but I went to Japan and I was in Japan in the 24th Infantry Division, located at Sendai, northern part of the main island of Honshu. There for six months, and from there I went to Korea, and uh, I was in the 25th Infantry Division in Korea. Okay. And what was your job over in Japan? In Japan, I was a, well, both places I was an infantry platoon leader. In Japan, I was uh, primarily a 81 millimeter mortar platoon leader, and then in uh, Korea I was primarily a rifle platoon leader. I did have a weapons platoon for a short while, and I was de uh, kind of detail for special duty as an aerial observer for about a month, where I flew about 15 missions observing. Uh, enemy concentrations and so on, or looking for enemy concentrations. Right, and did anything exciting happen during those? Well, um, by the time I got to Korea, August of 1952, the real heavy fighting had pretty much ended. So, uh, my, even though I was infantry, where you would expect <laughs> to be engaged, I was not engaged in any real heavy combat. Uh, the one time that I know absolutely I was being shot at was on one of these aerial missions where uh, our plane was the only one in the sky and <laughs> so it had to be shooting at us and fortunately it got pretty close but fortunately the pilot was quite, uh, quite good and managed to evade the uh, shell burst and so we got back home safely. So you said you're in the army. Yes. What made you choose doing the army? I guess from the time I, as long as I can remember, as a little boy, mm -hmm. I wanted to be a soldier. And while well, I say only on active duty four years, I stayed on in the army reserve and ultimately retired as as a full colonel. But uh, I uh, I just this is just something that fascinated me and. Uh, I, I considered being standing as a full-time regular army uh, officer, but uh, ultimately decided maybe reserve service was more to my, uh, fit me better. Right. Did you have family members that also served? Family members? That also served? Not really. My father was in the Navy for a brief time in World War I, mm -hmm. but uh, I'm an only was an only child, so there were no others, and none of my children have uh, served. So. so you went to the Korean War the last year it was going? Uh, I went in the Army uh, shortly after graduating from Clemson in 1951, so that was two years before it ended. But it took me about a year in the Army before right. I got to Korea because I went to basic officers course and at Fort Benning for about three and a half months and then I was stationed in Japan for about six and there was a good bit of travel uh, involved going over on a ship and all that sort of thing. So by the time I got to Korea it was early August of 1952 and the war ended late July of 53 so I was, you know, my Korean service at least was during that last year of the war. So what was your impression when you first got there? Would you see how were people acting? How's the morale? Anything? Um, I, I, I 
can't say people, uh, the, the troops tended to be rather enthusiastic. Uh, it wasn't a killer instinct or anything of that nature, but they felt like we had a reason for being there, a purpose for being there, and they were. Uh, I didn't see any real resentment uh, there any more so than uh, soldiers always uh, <laughs> have complaints, but <laughs> but uh, uh, I think uh, at least my experience was was that uh, the men felt like they, we had a purpose there and. A good purpose, and they were. Uh, they had rather been home, but they were certainly glad, uh, glad to be of service to the country. So, what were your the first few things you did when you got got to Korea? Well, uh, when I first arrived, the unit that I was sent to happened to be on the line, or the front lines, as it were, and uh, I. Uh, Went straight to the then to the front line and made several patrols, which uh, leading some oh usually about a dozen men, uh, and we would go out in front of the lines usually at night. In fact, I think all the ones that I did were at night. And the idea was to go out and probe around to see if any Chinese uh, uh, were getting close to our lines, trying to attack us or anything of that nature. And uh, so after about three weeks, my unit happened to be uh, chosen to go into a reserve position. We were still within uh, artillery fire, but none ever came in. So we were, we were probably three miles back from the front lines at that point. We were there all three or four weeks, and then we, our, our unit was sent to a uh, small island, Kojido, off the south coast of Korea, and we guarded prisoners down there for about two months. And when that was concluded, we went back to the main line of persistence, and for, uh, I got to spend Christmas uh, <laughs> 1952 on the front lines, and even <laughs> Got to make a, a patrol that night. <laughs> <laughs> it was a, uh, but in any event, um, again on the, uh, on the front lines. But I did not see any real intensive action. It had to, uh, had some shelling. Had had a few people get hurt. Several killed from shells coming in. Had couple, at least two men that I can remember stepped on mines and got killed, uh, but uh, but I was not in any, any intensive, well, really intensive fighting. Uh, none of the none of the sort of things you see in the movies with, <laughs> with bandits and, and all that sort of thing. And uh, from there I went to uh, the division air section for about a month. Well, that's six weeks, something like that. And I was an aerial observer flying uh, into what we call intelligence missions, flying out over the enemy lines looking for uh, emplacements, uh, artillery emplacements, or concentrations of troops, or anything that, that might suggest they were uh, likely to be attacking us and so on. And uh, that's the one time that I know somebody was shooting at me because we we got shot at once uh, in, in that plane, and we were the only plane in the sky, and the shells were bursting all around us. But uh, fortunately, a good pilot managed to evade them and, and get us back home safely. And then, uh, then we were uh, my unit was in reserve again, and this is typical. Uh, People probably tend to think of, gosh, you're there for nine months and you're being shot at all the time. No, no, you, you aren't. Um, we were in reserve again, backing up those that were on the front line. And then the last few weeks, I uh, suppose, really supposed to have been a month, um, well, a little more, uh, it was before my 
turn to come home uh, came up, a rotation as we go. Uh, my unit went back up on the front lines, and at that particular time, I was on a little outpost overseeing Pan Moon John, and our primary mission there was that uh, if any of our negotiators who were working at Pan Moon John in, in the so called peace talks, if any of them uh, were attacked or if the Chinese Koreans uh, attempted to To, you might say, capture uh, those those people and take them away. What our job was to uh, make a make a stab to rescue mm -hmm. our negotiators. Well, at least during the time I knew it, well, they, they never did uh, do that. So no one ever had to make that mission. Of carry out that mission of uh, rescuing them. But we did get shelled a good bit on that little outpost. And uh, But I wasn't out there very long. I was supposed to be out there until the end of the month of May. And uh, somewhere along about the end of the first week, uh, to 10 days of May, uh, they, need, uh, they had a troop ship that was going from Korea all the way to New York. And uh, they wanted to fill it up with people that lived on the East Coast. And so I got out about two and a half, three weeks earlier than I would have because I lived on the East Coast and they wanted to fill up that ship. And I got <laughs> so I had a long voyage home, but that, that beat, beat Korea. <laughs> so I was on, this, on that ship about 35 days. And then after I got home, I had little leave time and I went to Fort Jackson and spent Fort Jackson, who spent about two years at Fort Jackson primarily uh, training new soldiers who had just been drafted, just coming into the Army. Mm -hmm. little, uh, last few months of that time I was uh, a motor officer, but for the most part I spent the time training other soldiers and, and then that, that last few months when I was a motor officer I was uh, in charge of the transportation for our regiment, which... And then that following that, I went into the Army Reserve and I spent uh, 26 years there and ultimately retired as a colonel, a little colonel, and uh, had, I was in a unit that, that had the mission of uh, operating a basic training center such as Fort Jackson, training new soldiers. I was in that for about 19 years. And then the last uh, seven, I guess, years that I was in the reserve, I had a, uh, an assignment at the Pentagon with the, with the Inspector General's office. And I would go up for two weeks a year to work there. And during that same time, I went to the Army War College. It was primarily correspondence work. I spent four weeks at the Army War College Growing up our Pennsylvania, and, and um, one time I, the, uh, I spent about five weeks out in St. Louis on a promotion board where we were considering uh, lieutenants to be promoted to captain. So I had a pretty good reserve career, even uh, even though it wasn't full time. So while you were overseas, did you guys do anything for recreation or anything? Well, in Japan we did. Now in Korea. It, you really didn't have um, any you know, people playing cards and that sort of thing. But as far as, as what you would think of as real recreational activity, uh, once during your tour of nine, ten months in Korea, they, they sent us back to Japan for a week or five days to a week, something like that, for what they call rest and recuperation, uh, where you could engage in perhaps a recreational activity or what have you, uh, for vacation. And what would you do there? Uh, well, I remember going down to, was it Mount Fuji that uh, oh. we see so <laughs> and spending a couple of days there, uh, just sightseeing and, and uh, that sort of thing. And uh, the, the rest of the time, I guess I was in Tokyo. and. Uh, Tried to see some of the sights around Tokyo and that, but it, it was 
and of course the officers clubs and, and be some Red Cross bureaus or what have you, you could dance with and so on, but uh, not, nothing real special and, um, uh, in, in that regard. Were you able to stay in touch with your family while you were gone? Well, back then uh, you did it by mail and uh, of course my family wrote me very frequently and, and I tried to write them right frequently because I was an only child and my parents uh, probably uh, <clears throat> gave me more attention than they should have in some respects, but I, but I think this is one of the handicaps of being an only child and can't blame my parents. And they, they really wanted to have more children, just couldn't. And, uh, uh, but uh, I got a lot of letters and uh, I tried to write them pretty frequently. <laughs> but uh, that was before, before all these uh, electronic means of uh, where you can keep up uh, pretty much day to day, that sort of thing. Was it hard to adjust when you came back home? Oh no, no. I, I immediately <laughs> just, just uh, took off took off that khaki uniform and put on <laughs> casual clothes and white buck shoes and out out the door went. <laughs> no, it was, it was, I didn't I didn't have any adjustment problem at all. And you know, I, I'm not sure I can understand. I, I, this is a different day now, but, but a lot of soldiers apparently are having adjustment problems when they come home. I don't know if it, why it was that we didn't. If these people are seeing more intense sort of action or something, or I, I think it probably remote, though, relates to a different era that. Uh, that the people that that I grew up with had different ex life experiences early, and maybe we didn't expect <laughs> anything to, to be as to, uh, we, we, perhaps we expected to be under intense pressure uh, more so than people do today. I, I, I really really can't speculate about that, but I do know that that, that we're relatively few people who served with me or for that matter I knew a lot who had served in World War II who were just you know two or three years older than I am and um, I don't recall any great number there were a few but it was it was unusual really for somebody to to have emotional problems or anything as they got back home they're just glad to be back home and and, uh, and out of out of that Intensity that goes with uh, being in a com combat area, of combat theater, and uh, so I, I I can't really relate our experience to that of so many today that apparently come home with uh, with real emotional problems, at least from the news reports of it that way. So would you say you were prepared and expected what you saw? When you went overseas? I think so, yes. Yeah, exactly. Yes, I know. If, any, if anything, I think I was prepared to see a more intense sort of action and all than I did, so yeah. I certainly wasn't. Uh, Do you think it's just where you were, or it just wasn't as bad as, as I you think it, I think it was a combination. I think uh, uh, part of it well, does relate to the fact that maybe I was in a unit that just didn't get involved in quite as intense action as some even at that same time might have gotten involved in. But then uh, I, I think a good big part of it amounted to uh, fear of the unknown. We anticipated it would be much worse than it turned out to be. I think it's a combination. So how do you think serving has affected the rest of your life? Well, uh, I don't. I don't know that it had any. I can't name any effect that it particularly had. I, I, it was a good experience from my point of view, and uh, I uh, remain active in 
American Legion, you know, with veterans, and that provided a social outlet in that respect. And of course, I uh, uh, got a lot of friends from reserve service as well as I really don't have uh, the, uh, the the people that I was with in Japan and Korea. Of course, they were from all over the country, and as it turns out, I, I don't know a, a single one uh, now. They, because when we got home, we were scattered all over the country. I think people might have been a, been a, a two or three at Fort Jackson with me the two years I was there that I had known in Korea. But uh, but as, as I, you know, time went along, I lost contact with all of the people with whom I served in Japan and Korea. And uh, but. Uh, but there's camaraderie among all veterans, you know. So whether I served with them or with somebody else, it doesn't matter. They're got kind of brothers in arms, as it were. <laughs> so looking back on your service, what stands out to you the most? Well, I think <clears throat> I think there was a reason for us to be there, a purpose that was well served. Uh, don't, I think a political decision was made not to accomplish all that we went there to do because initially the, the intention was to unify all of Korea and obviously that has not, was not accomplished. Uh, but uh, essentially we, uh, we stopped the advancement of uh, communism at that point in Southeast Asia. And uh, well, I don't know if it's southeast, at least in Asia. <laughs> I guess it's more northeast, northeast Asia. And uh, the Russians at the time were were really behind the Korean, the Koreans, the Chinese, and it it, it, it had the effect of uh, of stabilizing the world. And then we had the Cold War for a long, long time, you know, but, but at least we were stabilized and we avoided a major conflagration and so on. And I, I, I think it probably had that. And, and so there's some feeling of accomplishment that you were a part of uh, helping to stabilize uh, world conditions a bit. How did the community act when you returned from war? Well, back then, uh, civilian community as a whole, like soldiers. Uh, they had gotten used to it in World War II, it was, uh, anything for the serviceman, you know, and Korea came so closely on the heels of World War II that we, we kind of became somewhat a part of that same, same group. <clears throat> That's one reason <laughs> the Korean soldiers, uh, Korean war veterans at least, uh, Sometimes people sort of left out because they just sort of folded us into the <laughs> to the World War II group, and uh, it was so close afterwards and what have you. And we we didn't get some of the distinctive uh, praise you might say that uh, uh, that came with World War II or with Vietnam or with these uh, current situations in Iraq and uh, Afghanistan and so on. We we just kind of folded into the <laughs> to the the early post-World War II mix, but not less. I think we were, the public appreciated military people then, more so than they did after Vietnam, and, uh, and there was a long period in there when military people were not very well appreciated. I think, I think they're more, more appreciated again now than they were uh, for the period, you might say, from 20 year period from about 1970 to 1990. A period there where the general public didn't have much use for the military. I didn't experience any of that coming out of Korea. Unfortunately, I think the public is, is more, uh, more appreciative of people in military, military service now. Well, we certainly appreciate your service. Thank you so much. Well, thank you.